Welcome to the future. PBS Digital. All over America, battered mothers are losing custody of their children when they file for divorce. I naively thought that, you know, if somebody molests their kid, I thought they'd just go to jail. Even with a proven record, abusers are winning joint and sole custody. To win custody of the kids over and against the mother's will is the ultimate victory, short of killing the kids. I was just snatched up from my normal life, and all that anyone would tell me was that my mom was crazy and that she was going into the mental hospital. In a case where the, those children have been abused or the mom has been abused, what's really best for children is for their safety to be made the top priority and for their healing. It was just so scary because I was like, like, let's run away, let's get out of here, you know? Because, you know, like, all this has, has happened. I mean, like, what kind of person would take you away from your mom? A third of the women in the U.S. will be victims of domestic violence. It will have devastating effects on their children. The Mary Kay Ash Charitable Foundation is proud to underwrite this program. Sometimes there's one child in a family and then everybody kind of agrees to abuse that poor child. Well, that wasn't true with me. My older brother was once almost beaten to death by my father. My sister was abused to a lesser degree, but she was quite terrified of my father. And as both my brother and sister would have agreed, because I was the youngest and the last one, and he had become much more of a violent alcoholic, I received the most brutal, the, the worst treatment. He would fly into his rages just for no reason at all and start mm -hmm. just behaving like an animal. And so I used to wonder if I were doing something wrong to provoke him to do that. And it took me years and years and years to realize that there was really nothing that I could do. The, the fear, the best description, the best two words probably are constant fear. That's the first thing, it's, it's constant. Um, it's always eating, eating away at you. Um, and, uh, and another description I would say is, um, another description of the intimidation I'd say is uh, ruthlessness. He was starting to reach in the drawer for the revolver. And I remember going toward my sister and grabbing the knife out of her hand and putting it on the table and saying, there. And I, I, I must have been maybe, you know, 11 years old at the time, 11, 10, 11, 12, something like that. And then my dad, you know, withdrew his hand from the draw. So I know I've been asked quite often, to, you know, have you ever called the police? Was it, neighbors ever called the police? My dad was the police. A pretty good life until I started, um, until my mom and my dad started to have arguments and over the whole custody thing. We went to court for the first time December of 95. The attorney put a restraining order on him for his actions um, with the abuse. By January of 96, he told me that he was going to ruin me and destroy me. That's when he came back to tell me that he would be taking Sarah away from me. When I was walking to school with one of my friends and he came in his car and pulled over and he tried to get me to talk to him, but I mean, like, I did, and he said, um, do you want to live with me? And I said, I don't know, but because I was afraid if I said no, then he would just keep asking questions and... Whenever I saw him, he was always asked why was I shaking because I used to I used I was I started shaking in front of him because it's just scary and I don't know what he's gonna do. The court said that my daughter spent too much time with me. They wanted Sarah to go into daycare because uh, after school, you know, they wanted to start getting her used to staying away from me. It's very widespread, unfortunately, among abusers to use custody and visitation litigation as a continuing weapon of the abuse. 
And custody and visitation litigation can make it impossible in one sense for a woman ever to escape the abuse. To win custody of the kids over and against the mother's will is the ultimate victory, short of killing the kids. It's the best way to hurt her and, and kick her down is to get her kids. They said that um, my daughter was afraid of her dad she didn't want to visit with him alone, and that was my doing. He was pulling her out of cars to, to visit with him, even when she didn't want to leave. And um, they said that I wasn't um, pushing her out of the car. Basically, they said that I should just bodily take her out of the car and drive away. And at that point, they got it in motion to start this parental alienation syndrome that they charged me with. Parental alienation syndrome is a theory that was invented by a man named Richard Gardner. He said there is a syndrome called parental alienation whereby the custodial parent, who is usually the mother, is trying to alienate the children from the father. And she's doing it by raising these false abuse allegations. If you have a child who is reluctant or refuses to visit a parent, or who makes complaints that the other parent is abusing them and refuses to go to visitation. The cause of that is the mother doing things to sabotage the relationship with the father. Gardner's research has been thoroughly debunked by the American Psychological Association and every other scientific, credible scientific expert that has looked at his work has said that there's no scientific validity to it. But they have acknowledged that, nonetheless, the courts are interpreting the facts in front of them in this light. And so if a mother comes into custody court and says, the father battered me and is putting the children at risk or has even abused the children, the immediate response is, she's alienating. This is called parental alienation, Your Honor. She's just trying to alienate the children from the father. This is what mothers do. What we know statistically is that several studies have found that 75% of contested custody cases 75% of those cases have a history of domestic violence. What that tells you is, if you're a judge and you're sitting on a contested custody docket, don't be surprised when abuse is brought up. There are dozens and dozens who will all agree with me that this junk science called parental alienation syndrome has been responsible for so much harm. And, and, and yet I am aware every day of judges basing decisions on this and, 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 and psychologists using this as knowledge and re making recommendations to judges because of this junk science, and it is appalling and responsible for so much harm. I received something in the mail. Um, I did not have an attorney at the time, and um, the court-appointed attorney for my daughter said that it was um, just going to be changing the visitation sites. They ordered me to come in to court, and that's when they had already made their decision to charge me with parental alienation, and they took her away that day, um, saying that um, I was not to go to her school, pick her up, that her dad would be picking her up. Two days later is when he told her that she wouldn't be coming back to me. I was in the van with him, and I remember my, can I go back to my mom? And because it was the day I was supposed to go back that day, and he's like, "You're not going back." And I remember because we were going to Safeway, and I ran to the payphone and dialed 911, and I said, "Help me!" But I and I hung up. But I was too scared. I just wanted to run away. I remember kicking and screaming. And he's like, "Stop it!" And he's really calm about it then. But I just like couldn't get over the fact that I couldn't go back to my mom, and I tried calling her. I tried going back to the house. Yes, and I remember that, that, like, I remember he let me go there just to say goodbye. She knocked at the door, and she was just hysterical, and, um, asking me to run away with her. She's like, we couldn't, and I felt really sick, and I had to use the bathroom, and I was all scared, and, like, I, I just couldn't handle it. And I remember him coming up the stairs and knocking on the door and telling us to get go, but I just, it was just so scary because I just, like, I'm like, let's run away, let's get out of here, you know? Because, you know, like, all this has, has happened. I mean, like, what kind of person would take you away from your mom? When a woman goes to court seeking custody of her children and seeking to restrict the batterer's visitation with the children, she's not asking the court 
to protect her children. She is simply asking the court to permit her to protect her children. And what is happening is not that the court is failing to offer her protection. What is in fact happening is that the court is forbidding her to protect her children from a very well-known, very well-established danger. Parents have a right to protect their children from abuse by the other parent. Protective fathers have a right to protect their children from abuse by the other parent. But it happens for certain reasons of social conditioning that the, that the person that is children are needing to be protected from is more often a father than a mother. We walk into these courts, we think that they're going to do right by us, and we lose our children. And this is the best kept dirty little secret of our family court system. So once you're defeated, it's almost like a process to get back on your feet. And if you look at it that way, you really have to take the emotion out of it. If you got the emotion in it, you're done. And then go through the process of how to rebuild it back to where it makes any type of sense. You have to get yourself up and then fight it because it is a battle. Cases where the mother alleges battering and risk to children, how many of those cases are being awarded custody to fathers. And what the studies are showing is roughly two-thirds award joint or sole custody to fathers who are accused or adjudicated of battering. There is a societal misconception that mothers are very heavily favored in custody and visitation litigation over fathers, and that that somehow will take care of the... would be doing other than what I had heard from the interviews, cause, because my sisters had said, you know, that's exactly when it happened. And I was so young, there's, there's nothing I was going to do. I was so afraid to walk into the other room and, and see that, that he was, you know, touching them and stuff. It's the most helpless feeling. About a year, maybe a year and a half after we split up in 1993, um, my oldest daughter, who was about five then, um, started acting out sexually on her younger sister. And that went on for quite a while. Um, and, you know, I, I didn't know what was going on, but something didn't seem right. And um, so eventually, um, my oldest daughter started dis actually disclosing things, like that her father was getting in the shower with her and sleeping with her, and she didn't want him to, but she couldn't make him stop. Um, first of all, um, when my daughters disclosed that their father was molesting them, they, my oldest daughter, who was seven at the time, uh, described him showing her child pornography and forcing her to reenact what was in the pictures. Um, she described being um, raped, sodomized, and she described him kneeling over her head, and she said, it felt like something pokey in my throat. So I knew she was telling the truth because no seven-year-old child could possibly conceive of that position and could not possibly conceive of what that would feel like. Um, when she had a sexual assault examination uh, at UC Davis Medical Center, um, it was determined that she had three old healed wound, wounds and one fresh wound and a damaged hymen. So um, my ex was not indicted. I mean, he wasn't prosecuted for the, um, for the molest, and everything got dealt with in family court. Cut out of their lives. It began with the evaluator who made a report that said that um, my sisters were lying about my dad molesting them, and it was because of parent alienation syndrome. And um, so he wrote the report to the court, and. Um, they believed it because he was hired by them. And then it um, kept going with the lawyer who, in, in court, withheld all the evidence of molest. You know, I naively thought that, you know, if somebody molests their kid, I thought they'd just go to jail. That was my impression. Um, so I was so taken off guard by what was going on. It was like being in the twilight zone. Mothers who allege abuse are up against, automatically up against this defense that actually they're alienators. Then what happens is when the evaluator is brought in uh, or the guardian ad litem, everyone is busy investigating her for alienating. 
and they're looking at everything she does or says and casting it in this light of she's an alienator, she's trying to alienate the kids. And it's, they're totally distracted from assessing whether the father is actually a risk and abuser to the children and the mother. The court-appointed psychologist who testified to this parent alienation syndrome had never read the medical reports. He never read the police reports. Um, he never even interviewed my children about abuse. When an advocate raises child sexual abuse as a claim or a concern, it tends to enrage courts and evaluators and neutrals. It's, it's the equivalent of throwing a bombshell into the courtroom. That's how it's received. It's seen as outrageous and extreme, and you're going to have to meet an extremely high burden of proof to persuade the court that it's true. It seems to me that the whole system couldn't have cared less about my kids. They were focusing not on my kids. They were focusing on me. I became this target, and their, my kids' interests were completely, you know, thrown to the side after that. I was, I think, seven and a half or eight. Um, I was put in the custody of my dad. I was just snatched up from, from my normal life and put into an alternate one. I didn't get to talk to my mom. I didn't get to go back home and get any of my stuff. And all that anyone would tell me was that my mom was crazy and that she was going into the mental hospital. We didn't see our mom for probably two or three months, I think it was. And then with the therapist, we went into a room with my mom there. And um, walking into that room and seeing her there was the most awkward experience I've ever had in my life because the therapist had told us not to hug her or kiss her or talk to her about what was going on in her life so that didn't leave very many options for what to say or do so walking in there seeing her and seeing her so upset and just being so upset myself that you know she was so close yet so far and what happens, Mom? You have support that you don't even know of. You have government agencies, you have senators, you have state reps. And if you go to them and you take your stories and you document your stories and you go to them, you will find people that will help you. You gotta support each other, you gotta document your stories and help each other. And it's a battle every day. And don't take no. No is not no. No is on. Go again. This evaluator that was at the bottom of all this, I filed a complaint against him with the Medical Board of California. He was actually charged by the state attorney general with gross negligence for refusing to investigate the sexual abuse and for giving incompetent testimony to the court, and he pled no contest to the charges. I filed a complaint against the judge, and after a three-and-a-half-year investigation, the State Commission on Judicial Performance substantiated his misconduct in the case, and he was disciplined. The State Victims' Compensation and Government Claims Board did a new investigation, came back and said that there was at least a preponderance of evidence that my daughters were molested by their father. And um, so basically, I've, I've won the case on the state level, unfortunately, and new laws were created as a direct result of my case and two other cases just like it. And I even had the lawyer from the Assembly Judiciary Committee come to court in 2000 and say, we use the facts of this case to create this law. And uh, the court said, um, oh, well, since the law doesn't say it's retroactive, we're just going to say that it doesn't apply. The Judicial Committee is all hang up, it's all pulled up by the uh, power of the court system. How many complaints against these judges? Boxes and boxes and letters from all women. And then I found out <clears throat> that one judge who is sitting on my custody has three boxes of complaints against him. We need to create meaningful systems of judicial accountability. That's a complex question. But judges who deal with family law proceedings 
generally are, have no accountability for their actions. Uh, there, there are very few battered mothers who are in a position to appeal. In some cases where they can appeal, we actually get very good responses from appeals courts. That's one of the bright spots in some cases. The costs of litigating a case like this are staggering because if you are a battered mother and you lose in, in, at the trial level and you want to appeal, the costs of appeals are huge. Um, typically 50000 is low uh, to pay for an appeal. We may need to look to jury trial for custody or some other way of making custody not up to just the particular opinion of a judge. This whole area of abuse, both adult abuse and ch particularly child abuse, is very fraught. It's excruciatingly painful material and it's something that no one wants to believe. And people who work in the field struggle with burnout and what we call secondary traumatic stress, which is what happens when you are exposed to traumatic material over and over and over and you get um, either numbed by it or overly reactive to it. You can't cope well with it because it's, it's traumatizing to hear about it. So I think some of what goes on in the courts is they're hearing about it every day and they're doing what they can to cope with that. And, and some of the rulings that they issue and the reactions that they have to the parties are their ways of coping. They're not good for the kids in my view and they're not constructive but it's their attempt to cope with the intolerableness of this material. We have a belief as a society that when divorces happen what's best for children is to have the most extensive possible relationship post separation with both their mother and their father and that's true in a typical divorce that's not true in a divorce with a man that's a batterer or who's a sexual abuser uh, in, a, in a case where the, those children have been abused or the mom has been abused, uh, what's really best for children is for their safety to be made the top priority and for their healing to be made the top priority. I think I'd given up. I'd thrown in the towel. All I could do was send them miscellaneous emails that I loved them. I exhausted $98,000 of every drop of money my brother my sister my mother and anything that we had into lawyers to protect them the next thing i know is a year had gone by and i think i went into more of a vegetated state go to work come home go to work i was out in california on a vacation and i knew that this was now or never because no one was going I was leaving my grandparents' house, saying that I was going to return a video game that I borrowed of my friend. From there, I went over to another friend's house and stayed there for a while. I went from friends to friends, just as everybody could handle me, staying sometimes a few days, sometimes a few weeks, to avoid being found. I actually didn't want to think about my sons. It was too hard. It, it'd pull you down to a point you couldn't get up the next morning. I said, you know, I have to get up, I have to go to work, because someday my sons are gonna come home. And that's when I received a letter in the mailbox. It was from Randall. He had made a decision of his own to run away. But my first expression was, oh, my Lord, he's run away, he's out on the streets. But in this letter, he stated that he was with a very good Christian family, and he was safe. After about a year and a half, my court-appointed attorney was assigned as a judge to family court. With this, I saw an opening, and I started looking for my own attorney. After a little while, I finally found a good attorney that I thought I could trust, and that was just the best thing that ever could happen for me. You all of a sudden knew it was going to come out on the other side, that he had a, an attorney that would talk to him and believe him, and that she actually said those magical words, your son's going to come home. Finally found a really good attorney, and that was the most amazing thing when I called her up and she said, what do you want? First thing she said, what do you want? Not, I think this is what's good for you. I was like, I was stunned. I, could, I didn't know what to say. I was like, okay, this is not normal. Um, 
So I, I told her, uh, this is what I want. And you can tell them I will not come out of hiding until these things are done. And it was amazing how fast that she, she got things done. She was up there, up at the court, filing stuff in the judge's face, saying, this kid is not coming home until this happens. And finally, they caved. We need to drop the best interests of the child standard for custody determinations. It's not a good standard because you can hardly ever find two people in the country who will agree about what the best interests of the child are. So the use of the best interests of the child standard is actually turning family law proceedings over to prejudice. I always, when I was a juvenile court judge, I would have the child in chambers. I would have the lawyers there, of course, lawyers from each side, and I would question the child and, and, and let the child express their wishes. It should be taken into the total situation. A year before I turned 18, I just decided to leave my dad's house because nobody would listen to me. My lawyer, who was the same one I'd had all along, would not listen to me. I had been trying to get Jeff some counseling for his depression. Um, as a result of the years of emotional abuse and neglect in his dad's house. And um, I fought in the courts to try to get him some counseling. And his dad, because his dad had legal custody, he refused. He fought against it. And he basically has always been given anything he ever wants in the courts. So Jeff wasn't able to get counseling. So after um, he came to live with me, as soon as he was 18, and his dad didn't have any control over him anymore, legal control, then he, I helped him to get into some counseling. And uh, my daughters are still living with their dad. They can't tell the truth even. They have to pretend like everything's OK. I mean, I see them. They visit every other weekend. And um, my relationship with them is, I don't even. I can't say I have a relationship with them, but but now I'm still in the battle, only for my sisters. I know they don't appreciate what I'm doing. They are not happy with me being here right now. But um, someday they'll understand that this is the only way they can leave. Sarah has been court ordered to return to her dad. She has decided not to do that. She's staying at an undisclosed place. She is going to her high school. Her dad has spoken to the principal, and um, the principal has decided to protect Sarah against him, seeing his outburst and rages in the principal's office. And she's not allowed to live with me. I don't, I don't think he loves me. I don't think my dad loves me. Um, I don't think he loves me because he wouldn't have done all, like, this and try to, like, bribe me with money. Money is not a good way of showing love. He's never considered of taking me out or anywhere except on vacation with one of his girlfriends. He's always talked about money and about how bad my mom is. That's not how a father should talk about a mother when a child is there and talk about how she's done all this bad stuff to him and how he's been the perfect dad. And I mean, how can you be perfect when you hurt someone so bad? It's like ruins you and it makes you feel like you wanna die. I think that your children are your greatest allies. If you talk to them and you reach out to them, they'll be more than willing to fight for you. I don't have to be connected to my mother. I don't have to talk to my mother. But I know as long as she's alive and there's a breath in her body, she'll be fighting for me. And I want to reciprocate that for her. And I think that if you get your children involved, it'll be a lot easier for both of you because you'll have each other for support and you'll have each other as allies in a fight to get something you both want.
If you or someone you know needs help, call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE, A third of the women in the U.S. will be victims of domestic violence. It will have devastating effects on their children. The Mary Kay Ash Charitable Foundation is proud to underwrite this program. We are PBS. 